I would like to thank all of you uh, for taking the time and making the effort to joining us here today. We're all here because we're tied to the naval services of the United States of America. And that, in fact, helps us define or define for us a set of standards and ethics and expectations of us as citizens of the United States of America. And we're all here. And um, before I start waxing poetical on that, let me ask you to stand, please, and we'll do a Pledge of Allegiance. If I may ask uh, First Sergeant Lincoln from uh, Sixth Anglico to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And uh, uh, Gunny Weiss Gerber, Chaplain, would you give us the invocation, please? In your own persuasion, in your own way, please. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity that you give us to gather here today to honor a Marine of the Year, to honor all the Marines that are here, and to live in the glory of those who have gone before. We just ask you to guide us to continue to hold the bar high so that those who follow will be with us. Put your loving arms around all of our veterans, all of our military, wherever they may be, and please bless the United States Marine Corps with all your heart. These things we ask in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Welcome all the members of the Naval Order of the United States that are present here today. Many of them are members of the Marines, Marines Club here in Northern California, uh, as well as all of our other normal Marine organizations and our active duty and reserve units that are here in the Bay Area including our San Francisco, but um, just sort of as, as I pan through the room, I'd first like to acknowledge and thank um, Captain United States Navy retired, Michelle Lockwood to stand. She is the commanding ge commander general of the Naval of the, Order of the United States and the senior officer in that organization nationally. Thank you very much, Michelle. <laughs> Major General Myatt, as, the, as our host, as our hoteler, um, uh, the Marines Club has that, always been that very, very special place here in San Francisco and for the Marine Corps back to when we took all the monies from all the unit funds that were left over after World War II and all those monies came back as we were shrinking from 600,000 Marines and six Marine divisions. We were able to capture that money and write the check for 12th Marine Corps District to basically purchase this facility and start the Marines Club. And General, under your um, leadership and stewardship in this time frame, you know, we still continue to do amazing things. And Major General Mine, of course, is our host here. Thank you. Um, we have representatives, of course, from um, 6 Anglico, 23rd Marines, um, RS San Francisco. Uh, the, you know, the mix has always been there. Uh, all the reserve units and their I&I &I staffs have been the heart and soul of the presence of the Marine Corps here forever. And this goes back to the way we looked like in 1980, uh, 19, pardon me, 1946, at the end of the war. And uh, we'll have more words on, on that in this time frame. But this is the place where it's always been happening. And even though we've lost the big bases, you know, certainly Mare Island, Naval Shipyard San Francisco, and all its attendant facilities, NAS Alameda, a lot of people forget that they're still, the Armed Forces of the United States are still very well represented here in Northern California. And the outreach from the community to the units that are still aboard through the Navy League, the Naval Order of the United States, their division associations, um, you know, the Marines Club and all of its connected clubs, you know, that extension is still well known. There's one message we would ask the active Marine Corps to get back to the United States Marine Corps is that this is still a military town. And the support that exists here uh, is ready to help any active duty Marine in any, and, and, their, and their supported units in any way, shape, or form. You just have to reach out and ask, and we'll certainly ask you how we can help. So don't forget that. Um, in 1995, the headquarter, uh, Commandant of the Marine Corps uh, basically started an initiative that sort of reads as follows. The Marine Corps has always realized that much of its institutional strength lies not only in its deployed battalions or squadrons, 
but in its reserves and in its former Marines and in the American people who trust, whose trust and confidence in the Marine Corps has won. In the past, this hidden resource has both nurtured the Corps in times of hardship and supported it in its mission of public service. In order to better organize this resource, the Commandant has formed Marine Corps Coordinating Councils across the United States. And it's headed up by a national organization that meets quarterly, uh, sometimes half yearly, with headquarters Marine Corps just to discuss trends and issues and, and, and items of interest to, and, uh, that are important to the Marine Corps and important to get the message out. We, the Coordinating Council here, are part of that message and part of that organization. And so it's very, very important that we continue to make that effort each time. And for those on the active side, what that means to us is that we reach out to the active commands here in the Bay Area, every new commanding officer of 23rd Marine Regiment, every new CO and I and I of each unit in the area, every new CO of RS San Francisco. Because if we don't take that first step, it makes it infinitely harder for the new individuals in those roles, your first sergeants, your gunnies, everybody that's touching, out, touching the community um, needs a smiling face and a friendly hand, handshake to help start them do their job and be as effective as they can be here in the Bay Area for the Marine Corps and for our communities. And so it behooves us as the member, former Marines, the retired Marines in the area, to take that first step, and we always will. And we appreciate the fact that you let us give us a few minutes of your time to give us an opportunity to establish our credentials as the Marine community or the Naval Services community here in the Bay Area that stands ready to support our active services. And all we ask on the other side is give us a moment to make our case and then let us show you how helpful we can be. Speaking to the active duty Marine Corps, that's the hardest sell in the world because we were brought up as Marines to be self-sufficient. And we'll die before we ask for help. Okay? But, that's, but we understand that. So hence the dynamic. It's a good, clean dynamic all the way around, and it works wonderfully when everything's clicking. And it's always worth the effort to make sure that does work. It's good to be back amongst a group of people that share the same common values and standards. Many of our life experiences are almost mimeograph copies of each other. Just the fact that I said mimeograph probably dates me a little bit, but that's okay. So for the record, my pay entry base date is 1966, February. My first unit in Vietnam was Mike Battery, 4th Battalion, 12th Marines. Um, that's just to put my little niche in a, in a marker of a long line because as I look around the room, yet again, I'm still struck with the fact that everything the United States Marine Corps has done and accomplished is somewhere in this room. Most of us that have been out here in the community know each other and, and know what our stories are, but they go back with our earlier Marines, certainly Lieutenant Colonel John Stevens, who was our Marine of the Year last year, um, who was at Pearl Harbor, as a sergeant, I believe, at that time, sir. Um, and then fast forward to Korea, where he commanded Alpha Company at the Incheon Landing, and then was at the Chosen Reservoir. And um, Doc Barker, who was one of, our uh, one of our corpsmen, up there with seven Marines on the line on the Far East side during the uh, discussions about the truce that took a uh, two years to happen. And Don Reed is a machine gunner. And then you move up a generation to Jim Townsend with Operation Swift, Alpha 1-5, Silver Star Purple Heart. And Doc Madfist, one of our corpsmen with 3rd and 9th Marines at that time frame. At Fullwater, China Marines. 1st Marine Division, 1st Marine in China, head of the China Marine organizations. And the stories are not untypical of all of us that are here. Um, Major General Ron Liu is also here to join us today, United States Army, as a young officer and an advisor to the Vietnamese units out in uh, three, four corps, three corps, sir, four corps, and um, in the early 1967 time frame, and uh, who finished off as chief of staff for PACOM, and where he worked and met Major, or then Lieutenant Colonel Lodignan, you know, in that time frame. So we're all connected. So yes, everything the Marine Corps has done is somewhere in this room because we're there. 
It goes about saying that General Mike, Commander First Marine Division of the Gulf War, you know, and we're still catching up with all the things that are now, now, just now becoming declassified, sir. We won't talk about some of those earlier times in Pakistan, so we'll keep that, you know, keep that there. And then you look around the room again, and you're struck by the fact that everything the Marine Corps is going to do, is going to do, is present here in the active duty Marines that are in uniform and amongst us today. Good God. You know, the dynamic is healthy and alive, and it's okay in a time and a place like this, in this place, of course, the Marines Club, to acknowledge that and feel good about the accomplishments that we have contributed toward this country and for ourselves as citizens of the United States of America. So you're allowed to take full credit for that time frame. You know, you can't do it every day and you can't be patting your back, you know, every, every hour of the day, but it's all right every once in a while to remind yourself why we're in the business that we chose, live the lives that we've led, and are having the careers that we have now. To our new Marines and our Marines that are currently serving and that will be coming back into the community, the community is standing ready to help you make that transition. So after you do your 25, 30, 40, 50 years in the Marine Corps, come on back. There's a place for you. There's a connection. Our networks are your networks. Our offers of assistance are genuine, and we have helped, and we have a track record of doing that. And there's not, your life experiences are our life experiences. We just are a little further down the road, but we're always, always willing to help. And we have the war of all and the time frame and at this time in our lives to make sure we do. And we feel that responsibility very, very, very strongly. So if you don't ask for help, you know, then don't mind us. We're going to ask you if you need help. And we'll help you whether you ask for it or not. But thank you. Going back to our Marine of the Year Award for this year, uh, we as a Marine Corps Coordinating Council have been, you know, very, very viable under the leadership of Don Reed when we first established these things back in the 80s. And it's been centered here in the Marines Club since, since its inception. Um, and with all of us being players at various times and levels of our responsibilities to the various organizations, uh, as we've gone through our, quote, changes of command, if you will, or, or shift transitions from one officer group to the other, one set of organizational officers, you know, we've kept the dynamic alive. Uh, but go back to 1946 at the end of World War II when a young Henry Tassoneri, who was our Marine Awardee for this year, had just finished a tour in the Navy at the tail end of the war as a metalsmith worker. And then got out and was working over 12th District and he decided at that point to join the United States Marine Corps because Korea was coming up in that time frame. But since he had already had civilian experience not only as a clerk for the police department, you know, somebody watching MOSs and life experiences then snagged him up as an admin person, you know, for 12th Marine Corps District. And back at that time here, here in San Francisco, we not only had the reserve units that were in the air as part of our command, but we had San Francisco Shipyard, we had Mare Island Shipyard and its Marine detachments. We had the Department of the Pacific, which was a Two-star, I believe, it might have been a third star. No, third star was uh, FMF PAC, H.M. Smith out in Hawaii. But we had a two-star general out here in the Department of the Pacific as the major command here on the West Coast for the Marine Corps. Doesn't exist anymore, and very few, not, not very many folks in this room, especially the new ones, would even know that in this time frame. But we were a Marine Corps that was in the process of resetting itself because we had just come down from... 583,000 Marines and six full Marine divisions and six wings and six logistics groups and all of its, you know, plus the Marine detachments, you know, it, it's around the world and gone down to a very, very small number very quickly. Um, I think if the last time I was involved in doing force structure numbers, we were playing it around, I think we were as small before Korea as we were before World War I if you can imagine that. And hence, you know, the epic effort that it took 1st Marine Division when Korea happened to move out the door, send a brigade to the Pusan perimeter on, under General Craig, and then ultimately followed on by General O.P. Smith to take the 1st Marine Division to the Incheon landing and then ultimately to the, you know, to the landings up in the Chosen, landing on the East Coast and then up to the Chosen Reservoir. So we understand that. 
But that's the time frame. Now, Henry here is over, over, you know, doing his job as an admin guy, and they're loving him. And they're keeping him, and they're promoting him, but they're keeping him. And he was very, very upset that he couldn't go for it. And after time uh, on setting up an INI staff, then back as the admin, admin person and, an ad, and, and the chief admin person here at 12th Marine Corps District, um, you know, which was the parallel command to 12th Naval District when it was headquartered here when, for our Naval Order folks, when 12th Naval District was headquartered here in San Francisco, plus all the ships at Alameda. Um, we were reconstituting the Marine Corps as fast as we can, and it was critical to keep those skills in places where they could be most effective for us. And Henry's done that. If I would characterize Staff Sergeant Henry Tassinari, who has been a solid, solid keystone for all of our organizations here in the Bay Area. He's currently the president of the First Marine Division Association and very, very active in supporting that. He supported our Marine Corps League organizations. Um, Henry is basically one of those guys that even though we give him a hard time about a raffle of an M1 that the First Marine Division seems to do every year and nobody's seen this rifle yet, you know, um, he's always there, making it happen, taking care of the store, if you will, and making sure the organizations that he's a part of has always gone forward. And it is for that particular reason that we choose in this year, in 20, 2016, to honor as the Marine of the Year, Staff Sergeant Henry Tassinari. Please come back. Those who can't see me, I'm just, just below the uh, microphone. Uh, when this was announced at the Marine Corps League meeting, I was speechless, which is a very unusual situation for me. Uh, I, I'm known as a garrulous person. Uh, I'm really honored and, and happy to receive this uh, award. Uh, but I have to give a lot of credit to my bride, Mary Lou. Uh, we work as a, as a team, and she's pretty much team leader. So uh, it does make a difference. Uh, so I may have to amend this when I get it at home. But uh, I'm happy to be here. and. We get involved, uh, especially since we, we're out of the Marine Corps now, uh, with, with a lot of volunteer things. But we do it because we've been fortunate enough to work with really great people. Uh, we meet a lot of people, and they're great to work with. And the events at which we work uh, are good events, they're, they're for a good cause. So that makes a lot of difference uh, to us. So, but again, my bride is the a driving force, so I wanna make sure she gets her due reward here. Uh, we hope to continue as long as we can. Thank you very much. I would certainly uh, add that for those of us that have had the uh, honor of working with both Henry and Mary Lou, uh, especially uh, Marine Corps League guys, we know better than to miss a deadline when Mary Lou has put something out there on the table for us <laughs> to make sure it's happening. So yes, and um, uh, you know what a wonderful team you guys have been for all of us all this time. Frank, thank you again. I would like at this time to ask uh, Major General Mike Myatt, the President and CEO of the Marines Memorial Club, up to the podium to introduce our speaker of the day. Thank you. Thank you very much. The logisticians, I think, are the most important Marines. They're the ones that make the decisions, the hard decisions, 
to do things that we don't like to do. Those decisions for the Marine Corps in the future that's going to ensure the viability of the Corps. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I was very honored to have General Myatt promote me when I was at uh, Hoover. And so I, I looked at General Myatt, many of us in my generation that watched uh, his exploits uh, as a division commander in the war in 1991. And we still, to this day, in fact, we still look at what he drew out and uh, use that as a template to understand maneuver. And so thank you, sir. Thank you very much for those warm remarks. Um, really is a pleasure to be back in uh, San Francisco. I, I absolutely love this area. Um, it was a pleasure to be stationed up here for the year. My family, we absolutely enjoyed the sights, the history, the people, really the people's what uh, I always look forward to coming back to the Marines Memorial. What a, what a fantastic place to be this afternoon. So I, I very much appreciate the opportunity to be with you this afternoon and to make a couple of brief comments, which I, I thought I would just take a moment and update you on the Marine Corps and what we're doing today and some of the things that we're working on. So let me first begin and say it, it really is good to be a Marine. Uh, the last 15 years of combat uh, in Afghanistan and, and Iraq, Marines have absolutely preserved the generations of reputations of Marines. Um, in fact, you can say without question that they've added to it immeasurably. Corporal Jason Dunham, Corporal Dakota Meyer, Corporal William Carpenter, Captain Brian Shantosh, just to name a few famous names that we know, but all you need to do is go downstairs to the memorial and see the names on the wall and recognize that many have contributed to this great nation in this last campaign and have done so with great honor. I recently um, left joint duty in Europe, and it was a fantastic service, fantastic tour, but I can tell you uh, without a doubt, without question, that uh, the Marines are relevant and the Marines are on the forefront and every part of the globe. It, it is not a fable story. The combatant commanders, first question in the ops sections, are where are my Marine expeditionary units? Where is the Marine? Where are the Marines? It's followed by where is my carrier strike group? But the first question that the combatant commander asks for is where are the Marines? And through observing through the Department of Defense how we allocate force around the globe, and because Marines are expeditionary in nature, um, we have had the ability to span the, the range of military operations uh, because we're expeditionary. We are the go-to force. So it really is good to be a Marine. Uh, but let's remember, it's also good to be paranoid. Uh, General Conway once commented that paranoia was a character trait of every Marine. Um, and we all remember the famous words by General Krulak, that America doesn't need a Marine Corps, they want a Marine Corps. So we're very mindful of that. So today, there are roughly 182,000 Marines on active duty, 29,000 Marines are deployed around the globe in 31 different countries. The 26th Marine Expeditionary Unit is afloat in the Mediterranean, excuse me, in the, uh, in the Middle East. The uh, 13th MU will be shipping out here in a couple of weeks to join up in her station for Central Command. We have two Marine MAGTAFs, one in Europe that supports the African Command, and we have another one that's in the Middle East that supports CENTCOM. We have Marines that are in Jordan offloading maritime preposition ships in an exercise. We uh, down the street in 29 Palms, we routinely are exercising at the brigade, battalion, and division levels. And in fact, just recently, uh, this fall, the VMA, or excuse me, VMFA 121, the Green Knights with our brand new F-35 Lightning, was in support of maneuver operations of the 1st Division, so a first for us. Very busy, as you can see, down in Southern California. This fall, uh, I had a the distinct pl pleasure to see General Dunford uh, relinquish command to General Neller, our 37th Commandant. And very quietly, and I know if General Neller was here, he would be agreeing with me and shaking his head. 
I know it firsthand because he said it. We all were very, uh, very sad to see General Dunford get picked up to be a chairman. We, uh, we really wanted to see the president sidestep him because we all are very fond of General Dunford. But I would tell you that we couldn't have asked for a better commandant than General Neller. I've, I've served with General Neller. I've worked with General Neller. He, he is a cross-section between a pit bull and a Doverman pincher. He is uh, absolutely a proven combat leader, and he's a visionary. So he's absolutely the right man for our Marine Corps future. But I think more importantly that I would share with you about General Neller is he's probably the one of the most compassionate Marine Corps officers I've ever met. And people that know him uh, see it, and you can see it in his actions. He is absolutely enthralled and interested in every Marine, right down to the private. And if there was a private and a general sitting in the room, he's going to talk to the private. And that's just the kind of man he is. And I would tell you that most of us look at that characteristic of his leadership, and we think that sets him apart. So let me take a minute and just kind of update you where we are in the Marine Corps. Each commandant um, publishes his guidance to the force. And General Neller will readily admit to you that, that General Dunford, in less than a year of his competency, had a pretty good direction in which way the Marine Corps was going to go. But General Neller did share with his, us his five focus areas. And while I, I don't have all the details and I can't share them all with you, I, I would like to share kind of the general principles of where we're focused on. First, General Neller's uh, comment to all of us was that our core, our center of gravity is our people. About 37% of our Marines are Lance Corporals and below. That's our most junior rank, really, in the Marine Corps. 61% of our Marines are 25 years and younger. So we are truly the youngest force in the service. Fewer than one in nine is an officer. And then, as you can see in recent conversations in the Department of Defense, uh, the discussion about the volunteer force and about what that means about the type of people that we are recruiting and retaining, something I know you're absolutely knee deep in over there. Uh, but for the Marine Corps, it, it's absolutely important for us to attract the right people, the right quality people. It's on the Commandant's mind. And especially when you, when you look at the statistics that less than 2% serve in our military, and that of one, one in four have the qualifications for service, you can see why that is so very important to the leadership. Second, General Nuller's place a very high premium on readiness. The Marine Corps is committed to readiness and recognizes that that's our ability to be the go-to force for our, for, for our country. And as General Amos, our 35th Commandant, said to Congress, the American people believe that when a crisis emerges, Marines will be present and invariably turn in a performance that is dramatically and decisively successful. Not most of the time, but always. As the Commanding General for the 1st Marine Logistics Group, Part of my portfolio is material readiness, as General uh, Myatt has described. Um, I work that every day, but it's much more than that. When we talk readiness, it's a mindset, it's a culture, if you will. The training, the mind, the body, the spirit, all included in our definition of readiness. And many of you, I know, grew up in that culture. Um, today, we are affirmed that after a decade of, more than a decade of conflict, that readiness is absolutely imperative to the way we provide our nation's ready force. That in training, our tactics, our techniques, and our procedures, it is absolutely a premium for us as Marines. Third, General Neller talks very much about training and simulation, the ability to capitalize on technology to train and experiment in maneuver. And while I don't have all his details, I can tell you that my good friend General Dale Alford who has our warfighting lab is absolutely leaned in to explore how we look at future forces and future maritime-based forcing. This past summer down at 29, excuse me, down at Camp Pendleton, we uh, participated in an exercise called Dawn Blitz, and it's an our opportunity to do amphibious landings. And in this particular exercise, at about the brigade level, we experimented with amphibious shipping. We figured refigured ships to see how that would work for us. We we're looking at how to maximize reach, how to do sustained combat power ashore, and we learned plenty. And experiments and simulations 
that are incorporated into those type of trains will continue to help us think outside the back, outside the box, which is what we do as Marines. And it's very much like the old days of Colonel Pete Ellis and the Pacific Campaign prior to our conflict with the Japanese. And with that in mind, I would tell you that General Neller has publicly reiterated our, our commitment to our Navy brothers. As an alumni of the Pentagon and the E-Ring, uh, I can attest that what you've heard of what you've read is absolutely true. The relationship between the Chief of Naval Operations and the Commandant has never been stronger than it has in this past decade. You see it uh, in discussions and how we look at the integration of the force and the requirement for amphibious shipping. 33 amphibious ships, it's, it's not a bumper sticker. It's absolutely the goal that, of the force and how we project power. And we're integral into that piece as we move forward. It really is the framework of how we lay in our strategies. Finally, I would say that General Noah's placed a great, op, uh, great emphasis on modernization and technology. And so we must be willing to look at how things may get done differently and embrace that and leverage it. If you look at the MV-22 Osprey, which is our newest platform, helicopter platform, it has absolutely changed the way the Marine commander operates on the force, the way he projects power, the way he lengthens his lines of communications, and the way we sustain the force. If you look at the F-35, the new generation of fighter, the fifth generation fighter, and what that will mean for the Marine Corps, it matches its stealth and exceptional ability to maneuver with that of sensor fusion and network enabling operations for us. So more recently, I would tell you that the decision on the interim amphibious vehicle that will eventually replace our Amtrak is also in the forefront of our technological advancements. The ACV, the new interim ACV is an eight-wheeled vehicle that will be amphibiously um, a part of our amphibious fleet to project power ashore. It's a combination of um, tactical and technical budgetary factors that led us to a wheeled vehicle. But with that said, its performance is outstanding. It's better than track vehicles, if you can believe that. And the concept places a premium on how we use enablers to go ashore. Not in, in speaking of technology, not in the too distant future, we're going to see things like additive manufacturing or 3D printing, the ability to, to go into a computer and print out a part. Automated platforms and sensors that are not only connectors, but are a, the way we look at the sustaining a force. Space, artificial intelligence. I could go on, but you get the picture that what we do and how we do it now may be absolutely different how we're going to look in the future. So all of this falls on the backdrop of the health of the Corps. And the budget of the Marine Corps for, six, for FY16 is about $25.3 million. And for 7% of the Department of Defense budget, we like to brag that we provide 21% of the infantry battalions, 15% of the fighter attack aircraft, 11% of the artillery battalions, and seven MUs that are all scalable. So when you look at that, some would like to say that the Department of Defense budget is absolutely bigger than it's ever been. And well, that, that's just not true. And you look at the share of the economy and on the total force spending, the budget is actually near historic lows, representing 3% of America's GDP, 14.3% of the discretionary funding of the government. And in historical terms, to put it this way, this is a quarter of what we were d during the Korean War, a third of what we did in the Vietnam War, and about half of what we were doing in the 1980s in the defense buildup. So such sequestrations on everybody's mind, and then if it does return, the Commandant has absolutely uh, been emphatic with Congress that the Marine Corps would be unable to meet its national defense strategic objectives as put out in that guidance. So we, we have that as a backdrop. Um, I think we just need to recognize where we are for financially and make the right decisions, and I think that's why General Neller um, takes a, a, a guard stock on how he balances those money, the people being the most important, readiness that is absolutely necessary, and how to do simulation and training, and then looking at ways to modernize that force. Very, very important to us. So let me just take a quick turn real quick and uh, talk about our current fight. It's my, my humble opinion that the world is not safer than we were five years ago. Uh, an emerging China, an increasingly dangerous North Korea, 
the Syrian fight and its impacts on the Levant, a resurging Russia, um, the unpredictable North African coast and that continent and its region, the Middle East, the Shia, the Sunni conflict, ISIS, Al Qaeda, the, the world is not, a, is not any more safer. Our nation's current focus on military operations is against the core ISIL in Assyria and Iraq and is nested in our overall strategy, national strategy, that includes diplomatic information and, and economic means. Last month, the chairman, speaking at the National Security Forum in Washington, D.C., mentioned that the design was to put pressure across Syria and Iraq simultaneously against ISIS. And you can see in the news in recent targeting where we're not only looking at command and control, but we're also looking at infrastructures and sources of their revenue that generate ISIS. I don't think General Dumferts is completely satisfied of where we are, um, but I know the secretary and the commanders are working all elements of national power to defeat ISIS in that region and increase stability in that region. And if you add that to the efforts in Afghanistan, where that government continues to grow security forces and, and the opportunity to do that, I think you can see that the requirements to the Marine Corps are not diminishing as many as we would all hope for after a decade of conflict. One last point, though, and this I thought was very interesting from General Dunford as he described this, and he illuminated what I think is the complexity of the next fight. You know, we tend to see conflict as black and white. That is that you're either at peace or you're at war. Uh, but as the chairman alluded to, we live somewhere in between. When you look at cyber warfare, or if you look at cyber attacks, and we continue to look at how we build offensive and defensive capabilities, you can only imagine the increased complexity. If you add in information operations, or you add in space or counter space capabilities, um, you can see where the modern battlefield will change, is changing. And you can see that where both state and non-state actors have those capabilities or will go seek those capabilities and look for ways to exploit the vulnerability. All, all of this illuminates for the Marine Corps where the Marine Corps is paying attention to and why General Neller has placed such an emphasis on technology and equipment that we will need to operate on the battlefield. So I, I could go on and on. It's a passionate subject of mine, but I, I'll stop there. Uh, and I'd love to, if we have a couple of moments, I can absolutely take some questions, the things that might be on your mind that I, that I may be able to answer for you. Let, let's start very briefly on, uh, on where the services are with respect to the law that was passed. Uh, and it's in the NDA language. So the service chief, General Neller, submitted the plan for integration of women into combat roles on 1 January. And inside that, I don't have the details of that, but that lays out the plan of how we will integrate the force, and those plans have to be integrated and ready to go by 15 April. The Marine Corps spent a lot of money and a lot of time on looking at how we would do this, and we did this well before the decision was made, after Secretary Panetta made the announcement. And one of the good things that came out of that study at 29 Palms, where we um, took women Marines and trained them in various MOS skill sets, LAV crewmen, tank crewmen, AAV crewmen, machine gunners, sappers, those, those artillery, those things that normally women were not associated in the ground combat element, and ran them through their paces in 29 Palms. And, and let me just illuminate for you just the extensive training that went on there. Uh, wasn't just the Marine Corps that provided that study, the University of Pittsburgh, uh, Center for Naval Analysis, there was independent studies from outside that, that looked at the rigor of the analysis and the statistical analysis that, that came out of it. And uh, as I, I was not there, but as it was described to me, if you could imagine one of the, uh, one of the norming behaviors to test was movement under fire, under load, and whether or not you could engage a target. And if you were that young gal, um, you could absolutely imagine uh, for a 14-day period, seven-mile hike, drop your pack, assault another close to about 1,000 yards, and then repeat that, you know, 15 times. You can see where the length of that study was pretty significant. And what came out of that was a set of standards across 29 MOS skill sets. So we have a better understanding now because the next part of that question will be, well, where are the standards? We know exactly now 
what it takes in order to test for an MOS skill set to be an infantryman or to be a tanker or to be an LAV man. So the way I would answer that, sir, first off, I would tell you that, and if General Neller was sitting here, he would tell you that we lost somewhere in the narrative about women in combat because women Marines have been in combat. We, we've had women um, kill in action. We've had women receive uh, combat action ribbons, um, been exposed to fire, return fire. We lost the narrative because we were talking exactly what your question is, women in the infantry. And so I, I think um, at the end of the day, we're going to follow what the secretary tells us to do. And I think General Neller came out very sharply on 1 January and said, we will integrate the force. Um, I, think, um, I think we'll see these set of standards that we've laid out um, be non-negotiable. So if you can pass that test, if you can do those repetitions and you can sustain it in that thing, then you have the right to serve. Um, women make up roughly about 7% of the force. So I think the real question will be is how well you can recruit and find that one in four that I talked about and those women that really want to do that. Um, I have my own personal opinions on it, but at the end of the day, Marines are Marines. And if you can uphold the standard and you can uh, be a part of that organization and live to that standard, then have at it. Good question, sir. So non-attribution, this is my greatest fear. Um, I, I would tell you we need a diverse force. We need women in the military. We need women in the Marine Corps. There's absolutely no question about that in my mind. And so I worry about the fact that if we uh, place that pressure, um, that we'll lose, we either break great Marines or we'll lose the attractiveness to join the service. Um, women fly helicopters, they fly jets, they, they build things, they drive trucks. They are absolutely an integral part of our force. Um, this particular emotional topic has got tentacles all over, and that is a concern. I would tell you the answer is no, because most women uh, that join the Marine Corps will come in for a specific MOS skill set. They'll meet their recruiter, they'll evaluate them both physically, mentally, uh, look at their background and see if they qualify and have the, the technical propensity to do things. They'll sign them up. So I, I, I don't think um, you're going to see where there's a black and white, if you can't do this, then you can't be a Marine. I think if you want to join the infantry or if you want to drive a tank, you have to be able to lift 200 pounds out of a, out of a hatch, put them on your back and bring them off that tank. If you want to be a reconnaissance Marine, you better know how to swim 2,000 yards and pass those basic elements in order to see if you can make the team. So th I think that's the benefit of what will come out from what we are a little bit ahead of the Army on what our standards are, and no kidding, lay them out for them to what that is. L let me just add one more point to this. Uh, and I was talking to the, the, t the Marines at the table here. When, when I talk about people, and you, when I make the remark about the Department of Defense looking at the future force, how do you retain, attract the future force? And if you understand the, the dynamic of the, the pool of people you have, and you look at the battlefield and say, it will be different, and you look at the recent events in cyber and computer warfare and information warfare, one of the things that I think that the Secretary is looking at is, Sometimes it may be the young lad that's got orange hair, lots of earrings. He is the, the very, just a different young man or a young woman. But that future American potential service member is the one, the absolute one, you want to be sitting behind the terminal that's going to be a part of that cyber team that can conduct offensive cyber operations to protect the United States. How do you go after that individual and look at those traits and those attributes that you want from that individual. Now, I could make the same correlation to women. I could make the same correlation to a man. You're looking for the best attributes for that person to serve and serve honorably and, and professionally and contribute to the overall combat effectiveness. Because when it comes down to it, the most important thing the Marine Corps cares about is combat effectiveness. Can you go and close and locate and kill the enemy? I mean, that's really what we do. We spend a lot of time on a first enlistment. If you, if you look at those statistics, 25 and younger, 
Um, when you look at the amount of Marines that are put through accessions and sent to both boot camps, you're talking about 40 some odd thousand Marines a year. We only retain on an enlistment about 19%. So the cut is absolutely very, very challenging for a young Marine to do a second hitch. He's, he's got to have, or she's got to have all the right professional uh, attributes. She's, she or he must have all the right training and have all the schoolings done and all those things. And then have the recommendations from their commanders, from their staff non-commissioned officers to their officers. It's very, very competitive, about 19%. And so for some young lads and, and gals, it's a, it's a little bit eye-ordering when they, when they come into the Marine Corps and they just think they can serve. No, it's, it's a very, very competitive environment. And I, and I would tell you, it's a, it's a good environment. It's good to be competitive. Marines who serve, uh, whether it's one hitch, two hitch, or do a full career, are all Marines. And they're all fine American citizens and go back to their neighborhoods and communities better citizens but it's absolutely a competitive environment. So what the sergeant's referring to is there are certain prerequisites, both in physical appearance uh, and both in, in physical attributes to whether a man or woman can continue service. And in this particular case, there's been some uh, uh, discussion about tattoos. And again, I, I have a personal opinion on it, but I also know what the Marine Corps order is. And, and the Marine Corps order comes from the commandant, and the commandant says, and that's what we do. That force that makes up ISAF is this, it's basically the Stability Oper Afghanistan Operations, is a joint service. Uh, Army, Army Commander General Campbell's got it now, and, and then it'll rotate. So the varying MOS skill sets are there, are designed to allow the Afghan government the ability to continue to build security forces and provide security and stability for its government. Um, it also has military experts that are involved in the, the, the Ministry of Economics, Ministry of Information. So we're working on all elements of their power to try to get them to stand up. It's a joint force. So it is not uncommon to see Air Force or even sailors ashore that are in certain specific jobs within those headquarters to perform certain functions. Um, I think, I thought you were going to go a different way with that conversation, and, and I would tell you that um, it is, a, it is a combat environment where they are right now. Uh, it was very sad to see that happen. It's, it's a tragedy when you lose one life, but five that way is it's a, little, a little difficult to take sometimes. Um, but I think that is the future of warfare. When you see joint forces, uh, we acknowledge as Marines, we, we as a naval force, we think we are already inherently joint, that we operate with our Navy brothers pretty, independ pretty, pretty independently. But now, as you move forward, it is absolutely reliance on the Air Force for space operations and counter space operations. It's absolutely reliable to the, one of the greatest armies in the world, our, our US Army. We cannot do without our big brother army uh, for a lot of things. So you see that kind of um, that, that give and take, and that's why you saw those airmen that were tragically killed. So the Secretary of the Navy released a memo on 1 January uh, directing the commandant to, to provide a plan on how, and the overall part of, of integration of men and women in combat arms, how to integrate our recruit training. And as most of you know, in Paris Island, 4th Recruit Training Battalion is a women's training battalion, and then there are three men infantry, or excuse me, three uh, recruit training battalions. And how you would integrate that. Um, I, I don't know how he's going to answer that. What I would say to the young Marines who are in this room, um, I'm very confident in the leadership of the Marine Corps. And so and I'm, also, I'm also confident that we understand uh, our civilian authorities and what they tell us to do. Um, and I'm also confident that regardless of which way this goes, um, we're not going to change the way we make Marines. I mean, we, we have a pretty high standard. You didn't get where you were. And, and none of, we owe it all to our, our former Marines to uphold a very, very high standard. And I think you would agree that everybody in this room understands, and we all recognize, the history that we have on our shoulders. And we're not going to toil with that very lightly. So I, I don't have an opinion, and we'll let's see which way this thing goes out. The best thing I would tell you is to tell your Marines, take a deep breath, boys. Remain calm. It's, it's all going to work out the way it's supposed to work out. So, so you can see there's quite, a few, uh, there's quite a few good things going on in the Marine Corps right now. Um, <laughs> between money and fielding equipment and then some of the other issues. Um, but again, 
I, I appreciate the opportunity to come and uh, speak with you for a couple of minutes and take a couple of your questions. I, I really uh, was looking forward to coming up here up to San Francisco again. And uh, I look forward to hopefully uh, putting on my calendar in the November event because that really is a fine event here at the, at the uh, hotel and I really do enjoy it. And uh, any chance I get to be around a Marine's Marine right here, it's, uh, it's worth every, every minute. So thank you again, sir. Thank you very much. Semper Fidelis. On behalf of the Air Coordinating Council, we wanted to give you one of our points, sir. Sure. I see there's a lot of that going on nowadays in the Marine Corps. But the second item on, on uh, perhaps uh, for the command deck, uh, it's a picture of your predecessor command, uh, MLG, Marine Logistics Group, used to be Force Service Support Group. This photo was taken of the assembled Force Service Support Group in Iraq in February of 2003 when, we, when they first formed up under General Lesher. Colonel John Spooney was Chief of Staff at the time, and there's a lot of your contemporaries that were part of that. And that's for us to you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.